Hey there, San Angelo. I'm Pastor Greg Breedlove here at First Baptist Church of San Angelo, Texas, located in the heart of downtown. You see all these empty pews behind me? They represent an open invitation for you and your family to join us for worship anytime we gather. I hope that today, as you watch our services, you'll be blessed through the music and you'll learn something as you hear the Word of God preached. We want you to know that God loves you and we love you too. God bless you. Have a great day.
aside the garments that are stained with sin, and he washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul of me, will be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood? I'm guilty is all that I can say. Mercy, your mercy, crashed in like a babe, and all my sin was washed away, washed away. You took them all, there's not a trace, I stand here free with every sin, forever washed away, spotless, I'm spotless, whiter Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen, for by this our ancestors were approved. 
By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from the things that are not visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was approved a righteous man because God approved his gifts. And even though he is dead, he still speaks through his faith. By faith, Enoch was taken away, and so he did not experience death. He was not to be found because God took him away. For being, for before he was taken away, he was approved as one who pleased God. Now, without faith, it is impossible to please God since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Interesting evening last night. Anytime it rains in the middle of the night makes for an interesting evening at the Breedlove house. The windows in our room face west, and so we could hear that wind blowing against the side of the house. And uh, if you know us at all, you know we have a bunch of animals, and animals don't always like the weather. And so uh, it started with, I don't know, one of our dogs sleeps in the closet, and it gets real scared of the lightning, and I guess somehow opened the closet. And there's nothing worse, that, well, there's lots of things worse, but this is pretty bad. You're laying in bed, and all of a sudden, the dog in the middle of your sleep is trying to jump up on the bed, our big 100-pound dog. And so that just scared us. I mean, we are, now we're scared. So you, about the time you fall back asleep, well, my other dog, you can hear him walking up to the bedroom. His uh, toenails click on the floors, and so you can hear this click, click, click. And then he can actually, or she can actually open the door with her uh, nose. She'll go like that until the door opens. And so it's like, okay, what do you want, Sassy? And so she just stands there looking at you. And so it's like, well, maybe you need to go outside. So Amy went, I think, and let her outside. 
And I think she came to our door two or three times. And finally, the third time, I'm like, oh, fine. So I took her outside, and she found a big old puddle of water and drank water for like five minutes. And I'm like, you came and woke me up just because... Well, about that time, I could hear my neighbor's rooster crowing, and I'm like, okay, it's time, probably time to get up. So uh, I got up, and as soon as I got up and turned the lights on, well, we've learned that my daughter's cattle uh, are on a very specific feeding schedule, and as soon as they see me awake, they decide to start mooing. And so at 5.30 in the morning, the dumb thing's out there, and I'm like, I am not going to, I'll feed you at 5.30 today, and then you'll be doing that every morning at 5.30. So uh, it was a great morning in some respects uh, at the Breed Love household. Hey, if you have your handout, uh, your bulletin today on the back, it's a little place you can take notes. And it says the title is Real Faith, which was what I was working with, but I've changed it. So you can mark that out and write Great Faith. Today we're going to talk about Great Faith. Now, when we think of great things, we can certainly think of greater things than uh, all the extraordinary events that happened in my life over the last few hours. We can think of places far and wide, and one that comes to mind as I thought about great was the Great Wall of China. Uh, This is certainly something that we've all heard of before. It's over 13,000 miles long. That's long enough. If you were at the equator, that's long enough to go halfway around the earth. It's actually not one continuous wall, but it's a series of walls. There's places where it's doubled and tripled up. It looks different. It's made out of different materials. Usually the pictures we see on the internet and on tourism guides, those are specific places. But there are actually places where the Great Wall has deteriorated or it's even no longer there because of time. Did you know over a million laborers worked uh, over the course of about 2,000 years to erect this amazing wall over all these uh, miles in China. And it's estimated that 400,000 of them died in the process. Uh, And so in China, they refer to it as the Great Cemetery, uh, that long cemetery. Anyways, so when we think of things like great, we tend to think of things like the Great Wall of China, these big, significant types of things. Well, great defined, according to the uh, dictionary, is of an extent, amount, or intensity considerably above the normal or average. So today, we're going to talk about great faith. So great faith is something that just looks above the average, and so there's something here that we can all glean from. Last week in Uh, Our prior passage in Luke, we talked about four signs of a false follower. So it's interesting that last week compared to this week is last week's kind of like a fake faith and this week is kind of like a real faith. If you remember, last week was filled with people who probably said all the right things. They cried out, Lord, Lord, but they didn't follow it up with any action and so it was a dead faith. Today we're going to talk about just the opposite. We're going to talk about a great faith. If you have your Bibles, open them to Luke Chapter 7, now this continues our, (coughs) excuse me, sermon series through the book of Luke. Luke is the third gospel in the New Testament. We got the Old Testament, which is the, uh, about two-thirds of the scripture. This is before Jesus. These are uh, the stories of God and his people, the Israelites, the uh, foreshadowings and the prophecies that are pointing us to Jesus the preparation for Jesus, if you will. And New Testament is all about Jesus. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, talk about the life of Jesus while he was here living on this earth, his ministry. They talk about his death on the cross, his resurrection from the grave. And then the rest of the New Testament, well, we have letters from the Apostle Paul and others often teach us about what the church was doing in those days and how we should live as followers of Jesus. And so for the last few months, we've been going through the Gospel of Luke. We've been gleaning and learning from the life of Jesus. And we come to chapter 7 today. We're going to go through the first nine verses, I believe, nine or ten verses, ten. So if you will, I'm going to read along. When he had completed all his discourse in the hearing of the people, he went to Capernaum. And a centurion slave who was highly regarded by him was sick and about to die. And when he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders asking him to come and save the life of his slave. When they came to Jesus, they earnestly implored him, saying, 
he's worthy for you to grant this to him, for he loves our nation, and it was he who built our synagogue. Now Jesus started on his way with them, and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself further, for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. For this reason, I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man placed under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now, when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him and turned and said to the crowd that was following him, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, as we open your word today, we pray that you would tune our hearts to you. We pray that your Holy Spirit would not only inform but transform us this morning. I pray, Lord, that if there is anyone here that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that they would not leave this place without having made a decision to put their faith and trust in you. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we're going to talk about three essentials of a great faith. When we look back to verse 1 and 2, we see that Jesus had finished his discourse. We've been doing the Sermon on the Plain. We've been covering that for the last few weeks. And he went to a city, Capernaum. And now verse 2 sets the stage for what's happening. There's a centurion who had a slave who was highly regarded by the centurion. And this man was about to die. So let's talk about some of these people and what they mean. Now, some of you maybe have been going to church your whole life, knows what a centurion is, or some of you may have been going to church your whole life and you still don't know what a centurion is. That's okay. We're not going to have a centurion test. Uh, it made me think of the movie back in the 80s, Alpha Centauri. He was a main character in a movie back in the 80s, but it has nothing to do with that. Uh, if you were going to go out and... Uh, go to a birthday party and somebody was celebrating their century uh, of living on this earth, you would be celebrating their, what, 100th anniversary. And so a centurion was a Roman um, military person who was in charge of 100 people. And so we know right off the bat a lot of things about this person. One is that he's a person of authority. He's a person of uh, influence. He's a person that has control. If he tells people to do something, they got to do it. We also know that he's not Jewish, he's Roman, he's a Gentile. This is somebody, if you will, that's on the other team in the eyes of the religious people of that day. In fact, of all the people that Jesus would have picked to describe great faith in the context of those who he was sharing with, the centurion was probably uh, one of those out there type of examples. I mean, this is a guy that would have not been highly regarded by uh, the local religious people. They would have probably felt oppressed by this particular person. Now, if we study the history in Capernaum, we know that this particular centurion was probably not under uh, direct uh, leadership and authority of the Roman government at the time of this story. He had probably been uh, given a different assignment, maybe with a, a different level of government. But nonetheless, he's in charge He's a Gentile. He's somebody that would not have fit the bill for having been described as a person with great faith. And then we also see a slave. Now, we could talk a long time about what biblical slavery meant. Now, in your Bible, it may be uh, translated as servant. In other Bibles, it's translated as slave. It's the same word in the Greek. Different translators choose to translate it differently. We won't go into a long discussion about slavery in the New Testament and what it meant, but just understand that slavery in the Bible is different than when we think of the word slavery in our more modern con context. Now, it was people that were still certainly under the control of their master, but slaves in biblical times, some of them voluntarily entered uh, being a slave because they knew that it would be a better life for them offering, uh, trying to fend for themselves. The Old Testament talks about uh, freeing your slaves after six years of service. And so there's <clears throat> nuances and differences in slavery. This passage really doesn't have anything to do about slavery other than just describing this guy who's the centurion's servant. In fact, 
He's not the main character, even though there's this miracle that occurs in this story. The servant who is healed is not the main character. The main character here is the centurion. And so we're going to focus and talk about him today. And that actually brings us to the first element of a great faith. When we understand who the centurion was and the fact that he came to great faith, that leads us to the first element, which is this. Great faith can come from any background. And that's great news. That's great news for you. That's great news for me. That means anybody on this earth has the potential to have great faith. It is not dependent on whether or not you were raised in church. It's not dependent upon uh, your background or your heritage or your financial standing. Anyone can have great faith. You know, as I was thinking about this idea that anyone has the potential to have great faith, I was reminded of a testimony that I heard from a few years ago. It was the lead singer of a heavy metal band, which most of you have never heard of, so I won't bring it up anyways. But he was a lead singer of this heavy metal band. And like, I used to like that kind of music, you know, like heavier metal rock and roll. But this, this particular band was over the line for me. Like they just, their music just filled with cursed language uh, not only against God, but just songs that are just outwardly opposed to God. And I just, even in my worst days, would never listen to stuff like that. And when you think about somebody coming to faith, you never think of a guy who's completely covered in tattoos, arms, legs, dreadlocks down to his waist, cussing every other way. You never think of a person like that coming to faith. Every single night by his own admission, just partying, drugs, sex, rock and roll, the whole thing. Every single night, night after night, making millions of money, traveling the world. And all the time his life is just going deeper and deeper in this pit. Because we already know that, right? We know that all the money in the world, all the partying in the world, everything that this world has to offer we know that ultimately is not going to satisfy the deepest desires of our soul. And so here's this man who's experiencing this in real time. His life is just going down and down and down until one night he cried out to Jesus and Jesus miraculously saved him and turned his life around. He became sober. He had a five-year-old daughter at the time, took responsibility, started raising his daughter, stepped out of that lifestyle so there's no way that he could continue in it. And now here, 15 or 20 years later, continues to be a witness for Jesus. God has a way of using the most unlikely people to show us how worthy he is. And so here in our story, we see the centurion, the unlikely uh, one who would have great, great faith, who does have great faith. You may be sitting there today and you think, I don't deserve or I can't possibly be a person who could have great faith. And I want to encourage you that that is not true, that you can have great faith. Like I said before, maybe you didn't grow up in church. In fact, maybe last night you were just like that rock star. Maybe last night you were living it up in old San Angelo, Texas. I don't know what there is to do. It's, I mean, I'm getting old, and so I don't go out after dark much anymore. Uh, but I did take Amy out for ice cream last night. That's how we lived it up. Told the kids we're going to run a quick errand and uh, took Amy to get a little ice cream. Uh, that's a, I guess that's okay to do every once in a while. So anyways... Last night, you may have been living it up on the town. You may have been stumbling down the street. You may have even, even stumbled into church today, still feeling the residual effects of whatever drug or whatever you're on. And I want to tell you right now that the end result of that is only going to be the pit. It's never going to lead you where you want to go. And your only way out is Jesus. And you don't need to sit there any longer thinking that you can't be a person of great faith because whatever's got a hold of you, because there are so many people, including the centurion, throughout history that have reached away from whatever it is that had a grip on them and reached to Jesus in great faith, trusting that he can heal and save them. And Jesus is always true to his promises. Maybe you have something deep and dark in your past that you're too ashamed to even think about or talk about, and you just think there's absolutely no way that I can come to Jesus. Great faith can be for anybody. Let's move on. In verse 3. So here's the centurion. He's got a dilemma on his hand, right? I mean, this 
slave of his that he obviously thinks of very dearly has uh, affection for this slave. Not, no, this is not just somebody that simply works for me, that this is somebody that I trust. This is a person of integrity, quite possibly somebody that he even feels is part of his family at this point. And this person is so sick that they're about to die and he feels helpless. And then we come to verse three and it says, this is the centurion. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders asking him, that's Jesus, to come and save the life of his slave. Now, who are these Jewish elders? These are just like the, the community leaders in town. That's what the commentators say. And so it's just like, hey, um, I really want Jesus to come and help me. I, I believe he can heal my slave. And so he asked uh, the local leaders in the town to go and talk to Jesus on his behalf. And in this verse, we see a notable distinction between a faithful person and a faithless person. And it starts with this one word, hearing. Look here in verse 3, it says, when he heard about Jesus. There are many in this world who have heard about Jesus. But I'm here to tell you this morning that just simply hearing about Jesus is not enough. Simply hearing doesn't save anybody. Simply having the information isn't the same as experiencing transformation. There are many here around our world who hear the word and never take any action. James chapter 1, verses 23 and 24 describe it this way. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. He says, you know what? If you just hear about Jesus and you don't do anything, it's like looking in a mirror and not remembering what you just saw. In other words, it's just in one ear and out the other. It doesn't mean anything. The distinction here, the thing that sets the centurion apart, the things that makes his great faith great is that he's simply not just a hearer, but one who took action by faith. What was his first response his first response, the end of verse 3, is to tell him to go tell Jesus to save the life of my slave. His first response is an action of faith. He believes that Jesus can come and save the life of his servant. He believed that Jesus had the power to change his life. And this brings us to our second element of a great faith, and it is this. Great faith hears about Jesus and responds. You've got to take that next step. You can't just hear about Jesus. You just can't just hear about how Jesus died for your sins and then rose from the cross three days later. You can't just hear that if you'll put your faith and trust in him that you too can be saved. You have to respond. You have to say, yes, Jesus, I'm going to put my faith and trust in you as Lord and Savior. You alone, you are the one that has the power to save. You know, sadly, in the news here lately, we've been hearing about this building, partial building collapse in Davenport, Iowa. I don't watch the news a whole lot, but even me, who watches the news on, if you hadn't figured out by now, I don't really like watching the news. Uh, just go back and listen to a few of my sermons on Fox News. But uh, I'm not a big fan of listening to the news because it tends to just all make us angry and mad and divided. And I just try to avoid that as much as I can. But you can't really help but miss this big story of this uh, six-story apartment building that partially collapsed the other day, uh, trapping many, killing others. And as this story goes on, it just seems to just get worse and worse. And for our purposes today, I'd like to highlight the fact that the contractor, one of the contractors who was bidding on doing the work on the building, vehemently warned the owner of the building that the building was in dire straits and that it was going to collapse and that something bad was going to happen. Not only did he warn him once, but he warned him twice. Not only that, but the day before the building collapsed, the contractor, I believe, who was working on the building called 911 and said, the wall is, I guess, starting to bow out. Y'all need to get the fire department over here to look at this thing right away. There were a lot of people telling the message. There were people hearing the message, but there was, for whatever reason, there was no action. There was no response. And as a result, 
there were dire consequences. Let me just tell you right now, I don't know how to tell you any plainer, but your life, if Jesus is not the Lord and Savior of your life, you are like a building that is about to collapse. You are like a building and people are crying out to you saying you need to heed the warnings. You need to recognize that you are a sinner separated from a loving and a holy and a just God and that unless you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, there's going to come a day where your building is going to collapse and you're going to spend eternity separated from God, God Almighty in heaven above. And that eternity is not going to be an eternal keg party in, in hell, there, I heard a dumb song on the radio the other day talking about a bar in heaven or something on the country radio station. And I thought, that is absolutely ridiculous. You know, you can imagine what your eternity is going to be like all that you want. We live in a, a world today where people believe that they can f- fashion their own truth. And so I can ask you, what do you think heaven will be like? And you tell me, oh, heaven will be like this. In fact, I'll sing a country song about it, and I'm going to talk about being in heaven with all my buddies at the bar, and it's going to be awesome. Now, there may be a good ending and a moral to that song, but I switched it before I got to the ending. So if you've heard it, you can come tell me later. But I'm just trying to tell you, you can make up your ending all you want, but that doesn't make it true. The fact of the matter is, most of the world doesn't understand this anymore. There are right and wrongs. There are truths and there are false. There are facts and there are fiction. And it is an absolute fact that your building is going to collapse unless you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because if you don't, you are going to stand in judgment before an almighty God one day for every single thing you did on this earth. Not only the small things, but the big things too. But God loves you so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross for your sins. And when he died on the cross for your sins, he made payment for everything you did, past, present, and future. And if you will just accept that payment and put your faith and trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you will be saved. God says, I'm not going to fix your building. I'm going to give you a new building from the ground up. I'm going to start you over as a new creation. I'm going to build you on a new foundation. Jesus Christ is going to be your foundation. And what I build from here on out is going to be solid and it's never going to fall. You're going to be in my hand and there's nothing that can take you out. There's a whole lot of people that are hearing that, but they're not doing anything about it. Quit not doing something about it. It's time to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we move on in our passage through verse 4, starting in verse 4. It says, When they came to Jesus, they earnestly implored him, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this to him, for he loves our nation, and it was he who built our synagogue. Now Jesus started on his way with them, and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself further, for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. For this reason, I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But just say the word, and my servant will be healed, for I also am a man placed under authority. We're going to stop right there. We'll come back to the little story here in just a minute. Now, if we just took verse 4 and we took it out of the context of the broader story, we might come to the conclusion that these religious, not religious leaders, these community leaders were basically trying to prove the man's merit so that Jesus would heal his slave. Hey, he's done this and this and this, but in the nuance and the original language and the commentators that I've studied over the last week, that is not the case of what's happening. And it even becomes more evident when you look in verse 6 and 7 and you get the centurion's own account of who he thinks he is. He's like, man, Jesus, I'm not even worthy for you to come into my house. I am totally unworthy. And so they're not trying to build up a case for his merit. And that's important to understand that it's not one of our uh, <clears throat> essentials of a great faith, but in a sense it is. We need to understand that it's not our merit that gets us a standing with God because we don't have a merit. We don't have a foot to stand on. I don't have a leg to stand on. I don't have a big toe or even a little pinky to stand on when it comes to God because all of my deeds are but filthy rags. And I know that sounds harsh, but we serve a holy and a mighty God. And so I'm not going to come before God and try to stand on my own merit. And that's not what's happening here because by the guy's own admission, he says, I am unworthy. In fact, I'm so unworthy, but you are so worthy that I believe just by your word you can heal. I don't have to do a special like prayer stance. 
I don't have to repeat something 48 times. I don't need some funny religious smoke or I don't need to do any of that kind of stuff. What I need to do is let you do it because I realize I can't. I feel like that's the attitude of the centurion here. In verse 6 and 7, we see the word worthy repeated. He, he's repeating that he feels completely unworthy to be in the presence of Jesus. He's unworthy in comparison to Jesus. And this gives us an insight to his mindset and attitude. And this is important. It's important to understand the mindset and the attitude of the centurion here. And this is what's going to lead us to our third element of a great faith. But he's coming to Jesus with an attitude that he is unworthy. He realizes he falls short. He realizes that he is lesser and that Jesus is greater and then we come to verse 8, and he shares this little illustration for Jesus. And in verse 8, he says this. For I also am a man placed under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. This guy has a little bit of the world's authority, right? He's got 100 people that he's in charge of. Uh, and if he's got a family and he's like me, he realizes I ain't in charge of them. Some, someday maybe I'll try to be, but they kind of do whatever they want. But here's this guy who's got 100 people that are under his watch care. And he realizes that he can tell them to go. He can realize he can call them to come. I mean, this is a great authority that this guy has. He can literally send people into their death. He can send people to the front lines of the battle knowing that they will most likely not come back. He can send people to their death, but he can't bring people back to life. He realizes that no matter what authority he has on this earth, there are certain things that he just can't do. And so he's come to a place of humility because even with all of this authority and power and control and influence that he has, there's nothing he can do to get this servant to be well. The only thing he can do is plead Jesus and say, Jesus, I am unworthy, but I realize I can do this, and that's helped me to understand that you, who've come under the authority of God the Father, you are God in the flesh, come to earth, God the Son, you have so much greater authority than me. You have great, uh, such a great authority. You have authority over life and death and healing. He realizes all this by faith. And so he's coming to Jesus in humility. And that's the third element of a great faith. Great faith is humble. You will, you'll never find God until you humble yourself. You just never will. And it's interesting because when we think about pride, we think about people like the centurion, we think about business owners, we think about real estate developers, we think about stockbrokers, we think about politicians, we think about people who have power and money and influence, and we see oftentimes that these people, because they have the world's comforts and the, the world's pleasures, that they've come to a place where they realize that they think that they've done it all on their own, and so they become very prideful in this position. And so it's very obvious and easy for us to see the people who have everything that the world has to offer as being prideful, right? And, and so we see stories in Scripture, and Jesus says, hey, it's harder for a rich man to uh, come to me than to go through the, <clears throat> eye of a, uh, the eye of a needle, than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And, and so we understand stuff like that, but we don't understand that pride falls on both ends of the spectrum. Pride falls, <clears throat> excuse me, not only to the end of the spectrum where people have everything that the world has to offer, but we also find pride at the other end of the spectrum, which is kind of strange, but have you ever known somebody who needed something real bad, but they wouldn't ask for it because of their pride? I don't want to hurt my pride. I, I can do it on my own. In fact, there are people that are suffering from all sorts of diseases and illness and de depression, you name it, but they're too proud to get help for it. And so we can see pride on either end of the spectrum. At the, at the core, what is pride? I think at the core, pride is this innate belief that you can do it on your own. See this kingdom that I've built over here? I can do it on my own. I don't need any outside help. 
see all these woes in my life, I'll, I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll do something. I'll figure something out. I can do it on my own. I don't need any help. And so you've got people on both ends of the spectrum who say, I don't need help. And let me just tell you, as long as you look at God and you say, I don't need help, you are never going to find Jesus because Jesus is the helper. Jesus is the one God sent to help. And the only way you're going to see it and recognize it is when you set aside your pride and you come to Jesus with humility like the centurion and you realize, you know what, whatever authority and power and control and influence I've been given on this earth, it's limited and it's not going to do a thing for my eternity. I need someone that is greater and there is only one that's greater. The Bible says that every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus is is Lord. There's only one Lord, and his name is Jesus. There's only one who has the power and authority, and his name is Jesus. The centurion was different. He had a great faith because he knew his limitations. Even though he had what the world had to offer, he recognized that he couldn't do it on his own. He knew that the issue at hand was greater than his power or authority. And Jesus was the outside helper. Now, if we look in the book of James again in chapter 4, starting in verse 6, we get a wonderful little passage on pride. Wonderful little passage on humility. If you taking notes, write James chapter 4, verses 6 through 10. I'll read it for you. It says, but he gives, gra- he gives, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. My, my, my. Not only are you not going to find God in your pride, but you're at odds with God. Now, you may disagree with me, but I believe God created the whole universe. That's what I believe. Now, you may not. You, You may believe goo turned into your shoe and it turned into you or something. I don't know what you believe. But I believe that God created the universe. And if God created the universe, then God gets to make the rules. And so if God says that I'm opposed to the proud, I mean, there have been some some people and some things that I want to be opposed to and stand up against in this life, but God Almighty is not one of them. I do not want the creator of the universe opposed to me. But the Bible says as long as you're stuck in your pride you're going to be opposed to God. So then he goes on in verse 7, says, Submit, therefore, to God. My, 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 we don't like that word submit. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hand, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy turned into gloom. Verse 10, Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. Now we could spend a whole lot of time unpacking that package. This is not saying you can't laugh and have fun at life. That's not at all what's saying. But it's, it's just describing a haughty, prideful spirit. And the author James is saying you've got to break down from that spirit. You've got to humble yourself You've got to draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Great faith can come from any background. Great faith hears about Jesus and responds, and great faith is humble. Great faith in what? Great faith in what? Let me just briefly, I've been talking about the what the whole time, but I want to briefly tell you great faith in what. What is the what? The what is this? The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so there's a lot of people in this world that believe we are all God's children and that we are all going to be ushered into his presence in, in heaven one day. But that is not at all what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that we are the actual opposite of all being the children of God. We are all, by nature, children of wrath. Why is that? Because the Bible says that all have sinned. We've all sinned. We've all done things that we know we shouldn't have. We've all done things that are against 
the laws that God has put on our heart. We have lied. We've cheated. We've stole. We've done things that we are ashamed of. We've thought things that we knew we shouldn't think. And God says, because I am holy and because I am just, there's going to be a punishment for that sin. Guess what your punishment is? It's death. It's separation from God. Not just temporary death, but you're going to be separated from God for all eternity. The Bible calls that place a very specific place. It calls it hell. Hell is not a happy place. It's not a big keg party where we're all hanging around enjoying the fire. That's not it at all. It's a place of eternal separation. It's a place of eternal separation. It's a place of utter isolation and just being completely separated and cut off. It's a horrible. It's not designed. God did not design it for you. But because of your sinfulness, that is where you're going to spend eternity. But the Bible also says, For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You've certainly heard that Bible verse at one time or another. Why did God send his Son? Because we have a debt to pay, and God does not want us to pay it with our life. So he sent Jesus, who lived a perfect and sinless life. And when Jesus died on the cross... And he shed his blood and his body was broken. God accepted that as payment for your sins and for my sins, past, present, and future. And then Jesus went into the ground and three days later, he rose from the grave. That's why we celebrate Easter. And and the Bible teaches us that we'll put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Then God will take our sin punishment and he'll transfer it over to Jesus. And it'll say paid in full. And so that day when I stand before God on the day that I die, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present present with the Lord. So when I stand before the Lord in judgment, he's either going to see me and all of my sin or he's going to see Jesus. And I tell you what, I hope you've humbled yourself to recognize that you do not want to stand before an almighty, holy God and make an account for everything that you've done in this life. Because he loves you so much, he sent Jesus to die for your sins. And if you'll put your faith and trust in him today, then he will take Jesus and his purity and his cleanliness, and he will cleanse you and purify you, and you will stand before God spotless and blameless. And so that's the what of faith. So if you want to have a great faith in Jesus Christ, understand that it can come from any background. Understand that a great faith doesn't just simply hear the gospel, but you have to respond to the gospel. And number three, you have to come in humility. If you want to have great faith, you can only do it in humility. If today is the day that you've decided you need to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you that you can do that There's a whole lot of ways you can do it. You just simply start following Jesus as your Lord and Savior. A lot of times we start that off by inviting you to pray and ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. And if you would like for me to help lead you in that prayer, then come down during our time of invitation and it would be my honor and privilege to lead you in that prayer to start trusting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe like many others who've been baptized in recent weeks, you realize that Jesus is your Lord and Savior and that you need to follow him in obedience and be baptized. I want to encourage you to come down during our time of invitation and make a profession uh, that you are ready to be baptized. Maybe you feel called to join our church and help us further the mission of Christ here locally and across the world. Maybe God's called you to some sort of recommitment or God's called you to the mission field like he has others in the last few weeks. Would you come forward today and make a public profession? Why do we ask for a public profession? Because all the folks in the New Testament, when they made a profession, they did it publicly. And so we think it's not only a way to be bold in whatever God's calling you to do, but it's a way for all of us to celebrate and participate in what God is doing. And so if God's calling you to do something, don't rob the rest of us of the blessing. Because it's a blessing for us to see God working through the lives of people in this congregation. So if God's calling you to make a decision today, after I pray, would you stand up and come forward? We're only going to sing for just a minute because we're going to do the Lord's Supper. So we're not going to sing for long. Stand with me now as we pray. Father God, we come before you today. We bow our heads in in humility, Lord. Asking, Father, that you would take the pridefulness in our heart and the pridefulness and selfishness that we carry, whether we're on whatever end of the spectrum we're on, Lord, and help us to bring our burdens to you this morning. If there's even one today that needs to proclaim you as Lord and Savior and put their faith and trust in you, I pray that they would come forward in our time of invitation. 
and make that decision public, Lord. We just praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm excited that uh, we're here to celebrate the Lord's Supper this morning. And the Lord's Supper is a special time in the life of a Christian. For us, it's a symbol of the faith that we have in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And uh, we have two elements. If you notice, the cups are stuck together. And so just so you know, you can pull them apart. Sometimes you just have to twist a little bit. But we believe that the juice... Uh, represents the blood of Christ, which was shed for the remission of our sins. And we believe that the little bread wafer here that doesn't taste very good at all, we believe that this little bread wafer represents Christ's body, which was broken for us on the cross. And so why do we do this? We do it because Jesus told us to do it. That's the reason we do it. It's an act of obedience. Just like baptism is an act of obedience, we believe the church has two ordinances. One is baptism for a believer, And two is to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And so Jesus said, do this uh, until I return. And so we're doing it, number one, to proclaim that Jesus is our Lord and Savior and to remember that. But two, we're also doing it to proclaim to the world that we believe and have a hope in Jesus that he is one day going to return. So I'm going to say a word of prayer and then we'll pass out the elements. If you would, hang on to them and then we'll take them at the same time. Father God, we thank you that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. I thank you for these special moments where we can remember the great price that he paid for our sinfulness, Lord. I pray that Jesus would come quickly, and I pray that many in our world would come to know him as Lord and Savior before he does come. We praise you. It's in his name we pray. Amen. If you would, take your bread. Lord, we just, we thank you that your body was broken for us. Lord, help us to live our lives and follow after you each and every day. It's in your name we pray. If you would, take your juice. Let's pray. Lord, we... We recognize that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so we come before you today and we thank you that you love us so much that you would shed your blood to pay the price for our sins. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for taking time to worship with us today, whether you're watching on TV or online. You can learn more about First Baptist Church at our Facebook page on our website, or by calling the church during business hours. We hope that you've been blessed. We're praying that you have a great week ahead. God bless you.